Uh, Jim has been a good supporter of the Sierra Club almost since we when we uh, established this. Uh, I didn't realize it that, that far back, but I've always had a love for the outdoors yeah. and all that. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying you joined the Sierra Club in 1892. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know you had a big birthday recently, but. <laughs> But he's been a member of this group almost from the beginning, and uh, uh, you know he's an interesting guy. He's got a lot of good stories to tell. He's obviously uh, worked really hard putting this together, and uh, you know, um, without further ado, uh, you know, over to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you people must have thought this was church because you waited for the back row. <laughs> so maybe my voice is going to reach out. If it don't, if you can't have a trouble hearing, just give me a little bit and I'll rev up the volume a little bit. I am Jim Green and uh, I, I am 90 years young as of 1st September this year. Had a wonderful celebration. Yay! Some, some of you people were in attendance to my birthday party at Christ Central Church down Rainbow Drive. And so I appreciate that and I had a wonderful uh, birthday book made. I had, we had 143 registered guests in that day, which I, I didn't know I had that many people knew me, but anyway, they were making fun. I have a good friend of mine here, Louis Humphrey from Ohatchee. Uh, this uh, young fella, he's young to me. <laughs> uh, I met him when he was in high school in Ohatchee. At that time, I was here and, and uh, was doing some trapping and, and doing some fur buying on the road, and I found out those boys down there were trapping some, so I went down to visit them. I met him, and it's been a good relationship down through the years. He has since uh, worked at Goodyear for I don't know how many years, but he retired recently. How year? 11 years ago. How much? Oh, wow! I didn't realize. You're not caught up either, are you? Okay. I was born in Northwest Georgia, and the, the oldest son of a family in a family of four. I had two sisters and one brother. And I uh, I attended. Uh, uh, one room school to begin with and the teacher had uh, up to the sixth or seventh grade that she taught all in one room and pretty soon only in the, in the second year from that they began consolidating those small schools and moved us into other schools and we gradually got into uh, 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 where they had seventh and eighth grade and separated and finally in high school and I my dad wanted us to finish finish uh, school, so he made it a point to do that and made it possible for us to do so. When, uh, when a country boy got to be 12, 14 years old, back in those days, he either he had to go to work at a sawmill or, or something else, working for someone else, or else he just dropped out of school. So getting a high school education in those days was a plus, so I'm thankful and fortunate for that. Uh, <clears throat> My uh, first foray into Alabama, my dad and mother carried us on picnic about once a month. And uh, we would get in the old used car and head off somewhere to where there was some, uh, hopefully a, a clean spring. And back in then days, we turned them all clean because we drank water out of them then when we got there. And if it was forcing enough, we would have a, a swimming hole nearby. So we would go swimming. So they, so on the, one Sunday we got in the car and headed, we, we lived at, up above Rome, about 20 miles above Rome, Georgia. We headed to Somerville, Georgia, which is west, and then from there we headed over to Fort Payne, Alabama. That was a big deal with us. We had never been out of the state, so just mentioning Alabama and out of state was a great thing. We came over the mountain and came down near through the outskirts of Fort Payne, and there's some fine, uh, big limestone rocks with moss and all that stuff, but it didn't have any water. But nevertheless, we wouldn't traveling long enough to be good and hungry, so we spread our lunch there and uh, had a nice picnic and went home. And as we met our little friends around and all, we've been to Alabama. 
So that was a big deal. Another excursion that we had, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but an excursion we had, my dad was a carpenter and a good carpenter. He was a jack of all trades, really, but uh, there was a, a family up in the area where we grew up in that <coughs> got into the Coca-Cola stock in, in Atlanta, Georgia, back in the 30s. And in, in short terms, he made a million dollars out of it. So that was terrific. And so he began spending some of that money back in where he grew up. And he bought several big farms and began to improve and all. And my dad worked carpenter work and other work there, basically carpenter and building. And uh, they had a good touring car. And uh, so uh, one of his sisters and her husband lived there at the old home place. And so they invited us one Sunday to go to Chattanooga, Tennessee. So that was a really big deal. You can imagine the real, real thrill that we had in mind there. And uh, we went to Chattanooga and uh, we saw Rock City. How many of you have ever seen the sign? See Rock City. Oh, okay, okay. We saw Rock City. Okay, on the and we saw the incline, but we didn't get to ride it. But we we didn't have the extra money to do that. But nevertheless, we saw it. And uh, on the top of this hotel, I mean, on top of this lookout mountain, there's a hotel up there, and it's still sitting up there. I haven't been to it, never have been back to it, but it's still sitting up there, and I'd see it. So we went down to see the the hotel and the and the uh, the sister of this man that had the money and was furnishing rebuilding the park his sister was married to a staunch old Methodist old time minister he was he was died in the wool black so we went in through the hotel and down through the the lobby and on down through between the rooms and they had a swimming pool in there I'd never seen an indoor swimming pool in fact, I never had seen any indoor plumbing until that. And that. <laughs> but nevertheless, the men and women are swimming in this swimming pool together. So the old preacher, he goes up to the door and he steps that old finger and he says, Y'all are going straight to hell. <laughs> and his wife grabbed him, you know. But anyway, we had, a, we, had a good, we had a very good trip. And that was, our, that was our trip to Tennessee. So we had been touched out by Tennessee. Now I'm going to get off of that. So I'm a, I'm a man of many hats. This is my gentleman Jen hat. Mm. This is a cap that I enjoy. I think I earned this cap. So this is presented to me the Patriots flight, and I had the privilege of going to Washington D.C. That was a long day, if y'all believe it or not. I think I got up at one or two o'clock in the morning, went over and caught the bus over at Cross Point. Then we proceeded to Birmingham and met up with a hundred and something vets down there. We boarded a beautiful big jet and headed for Washington. And with uh, a little turbulence before we got in up there and cloudy and all, and I didn't know, that's my first flight. But anyway, I was, I was fine. We, had, we did have one man pass out, so that was a little bit. <laughs> but we had a doctor on board, so he comes back and we get him up on the, in the aisle and stretch him out, and so pretty soon he was okay. And also, I had the privilege of sharing my time with another man from here. That, that he and I were about in the same class, uh, as far as physically concerned, you know. And we did not have to have a a, a full-time man with us. They did have people who had full-time person to take care of them. And they had wheelchair patients, which they were, we were all well taken care of. It was a, a wonderful experience, and I got, I never had, even I traveled all over the East Coast and across there many times, I had never touched Washington, D.C. The War Memorial was wonderful, and the Marine statue, if you ever see that, you'll know why. I tear up at it. Hmm. So that, that was a wonderful trip for us. We got back into Birmingham with a good flight in and got back here at 10, 11 o'clock that night. 
but I was on such a high that I never did know I was even tired. <laughs> so that's my veteran day. I spent three and a half years in the service of military police. And I <clears throat> took my basic training in Camp Gordon, Georgia, and then transferred was transferred to Illinois. They seemed to send the boys from the north down to the south and us back up to the north. But anyway, I was involved in military police work there and uh, did a lot of ex escort guard duty. We, uh, we moved stuff on railroads from, from Rock Island Arsenal in Illinois to, the, to the New York and Boston and the Navy Yards and all that place, back and forth on the trains. Every time the train stopped, we was off and patrolling around that because that stuff was, was uh, war uh, products and most of it big guns and all were covered up with tarps and all. And we did carry the first tanks that had flamethrowers on them to the Boston Navy Yards and they went on to the South Pacific and they used those flamethrowers to a good advantage there in the South Pacific. Not having to have a man go up there with that ball of fire on his back to try to blast a uh, gap out of a, a, one of those caves that they had entrenched themselves in. I was very fortunate to uh, caught a, a detail out of, of Illinois and right after the invasion over there and Rama was wrapping up all of the troops there in North Africa and the, they were sending prisoners of war by streams back to the back. And in, in, in Oran, North Africa, they set up a prison of war camp uh, camp there, stockade rather, that was a mile square. The barbed wire, double, double uh, barbed wire fence with a machine, 30 caliber, caliber machine gun on the corners and along through the side. And when you change guard, they says, rip off a few bullets down through that no man's land, which we did. And you never saw a POW go close to that place. So I was very fortunate to be there for a while and then came back to the United States with 700 and something prisoners of war. 500 Italians and about 250 or 75 Austrians. The Austrians were very fine men. They had been conscripted and they were all from 37 up to 40 years of age. They were elderly men, you know, you wouldn't, but they, t Germany conscripted them and put them in, but they were no mood to do any more fighting, so when they had the opportunity, they were, were good to also people. So I did come back to the States, and uh, I worked with those prisoners of war about nine months. And uh, then I began more uh, of uh, train duty and military police and all, and I, I did, one thing that I did, we did in our escorting, there might be some news to you people, is the fact that they made submarines up in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Now that's way in to be making submarines. They put them in a dry dock and brought them down through Lake Michigan and to Chicago, and uh, they didn't put them in the dry dock there. They, they unknown power came down and then put in a dry dock and went down the Illinois River and to St. Louis, Missouri. And we stopped, we, we stopped the traffic and guarded the bridges, railroad crossing, and everything where they were there on that canal and all. And we worked that in the wintertime and when the ice was two and three foot deep, uh, thick on the, on the locks where they locked those and carried that thing through there, you'd have to take a fireman's axe and pick the ice off of the place where you put the housers on them to launch that in as you lowered the boats and all. That's all I'm going to touch on that, but that was unusual to me. I'd never seen a submarine. I'd heard one, but never. Okay, I'm going to. Uh, well, by the way, I was one. I could. I need to finish this up. Uh, I was married. I married. I met and married Aline Sutherland. She was related to the Sutherlands here in Gadsden, and uh, she was from Forney, Alabama, and had. To, she came here and went to business college, and then was employed at Goodyear. So uh, I thought I was going to get out of service in 45 in September. So we got married in May and I didn't get out until the next March. So that's, that was the 
And then I came here and I settled in Gadsden and um, I worked carpenter work and floor finishing and tile laying for from in 46 until in 48. In April 12, 48, I went to Alice Shelmer. I've got a good story for you here now. Listen up on this. The McCormicks are sitting back there. Martha McCormick loves cats. She is really a cat lover. So there, there was an old house. They bought, they bought, the, well, they inherited and bought and some land that was uh, uh, Martha's mother and daddy's place. So they owned from Riverside Drive to the river back there. And there was an old house place back there. So they, uh, Mike likes raised good, beautiful cattle. And so they got them some cattle. And so they left the old house place there. And, uh, and made a feed bin out of barn out of it and all. So uh, anyway, they had the cat foods there and, and the cats multiplied and did well. <laughs> <laughs> so it got kind of a joke like this, but it got around word that Moth Moth McCormick's got a cat house down there. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a feline cat. <laughs> You're going to kill me later, Marshall. <laughs> but uh, this uh, this coon, he took up residence there, and he was eating up the cat food, and he was laying it on. So Martha didn't like that too much, so she puts it in a in a uh, garbage pail and puts a bungee cord over it. So so that coon, he wrestled with that. He got the bungee cord off, and so but, so I told Mike, I said, Mike, I'll bring you a live trap, and uh, so. We'll we'll uh, we'll bring your live trap. We'll take care take care of that. And so I brought him a live trap like this. That's there. That's a good good trap for, for a gardener or a guy like Steve down here on the river. He's going if he don't have one that big, he'd need one for long. But nevertheless, <laughs> Mike caught the coon. So he he said, "What you going to do with him, Jim?" I said, "Well." The fur is not good, and there is a time of fur is prime and the time it's not. I said, well, okay, I, I just rather you wouldn't kill him. And I said, I don't ever kill any animals in out of season and all like that. And he said, okay, I'll take care of you. So I asked him, and day or two, I said, what do you do with him, Mike? He said, well, I took him out <laughs> beyond Glencoe and said, I changed his zip code. <laughs> <laughs> so we had lots of fun about that. And, uh, and I was I was up at Martha and Mike's the other day, and uh, by the way, she gave me a Savoy cabbage. Honest was that big, and she's a great gardener and a great person. Period. But anyway, I was up there and and uh, we we shared some stories and all about uh, earlier in a lifetime and all. So uh, I enjoyed that. But Mike changed. Several zip codes on the coons there because they kept coming in. and now she she's got three or four cats down there at that old house place and and the other day she said to me uh, I was up there in fact I was up there to uh, put out a little bit of chum for some coyotes that that live up in the area and I we have to be very careful there and uh, I don't do this very often. But she said, she had a beautiful cat come out there at the garden. I said, it's something about beautiful cats. She said, yeah, but those coyotes. I said, yeah, they love them. And my, down at my neighbor's house down there, and he was uh, down below me, and this is, I live on Murray Drive down near the assisted living in East Cassidy. Uh, he below the assisted living there, a gardener. So he was in the house, and he heard something screaming and carrying on his cat. So he ran out the back, he had lost, one cat had disappeared. So he ran out and he thought that maybe was a fight going on. He got out there and there were two coyotes and they had the other cat and one had one end and one the other, so they mangled him. He had been shooting some jaybirds and we had some bird shot in his single barrel shotgun. He let off a, burned him a little bit, but that's it. You've got to have something really strong to do a coyote in. So, We'll talk a bit that when we get to the coyotes. Uh, we, uh, uh, one lady asked me about a weasel. Now, you, this is a big fella, isn't he? <laughs> this, this is a brown weasel. This, this, this is our Alabama weasel. I heard they were mean. They're mean. 
Okay. They're they're cousin to a mink or something. They're, they're, this is this little this little fellow here, the guy down there that lived below me in the chicken plant and lived on the island that Mr. Lee developed and put a lot of nice houses on there. One of them had him a chicken coop out the end of his dock. So he had, uh, I think he had 11 <coughs> frying chickens in there, in that chicken coop. So one morning he went out there and his chickens all over scattered over there with their heads chewed and their throats cut. So he called Bobby Morgan across the lake and said, hey, what's going on here? So he said, well, I'll ask. I'll call Mr. Green and he'll come down here and we'll just cipher what's going on. So I figured it was a mink. I figured it was a female mink and she was just looking for a place to get some extra food. But the weasels are notorious for killing. They are turkeys. It was a turkey that he killed. Oh, yeah. Oh. They are, they are egg eaters or, or bird eaters. And all. So this is, uh, I've only caught uh, maybe six or seven of these in my, all of my trapping career. But is he a big one? But he, he has an odor kind of like a mink, and they're not the mink odor and the weasel is not as strong as a skunk, but yet it is strong. Okay, I thought, uh, how many know what this is? Ermine. Right, this is an ermine. This is uh, come from Minnesota. And he's brown in the summer, and comes winter, he turns white. And there are snowshoe rabbits that do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But you notice the little black tip, it, that's what determines. There's one that's smaller than this, a short tail ermine. But anyway, that is, I ordered this one, and so the guy that, the, the, the people that do my tanning and all, and do my manufacturing, the books and all, I called him and I said, hey, I need an ermine. Yeah, I can handle it. I said, I said what did you charge me? He said, are you rich? I said, I've always been poor, but I'm rich in life. He said, I'll send you one for ten dollars. So that's what we got. But anyway, it's a good comparison, a good talking thing. And we have very few. But uh, it's not on the endangered see, uh, list, but it's on a protected list. That and a civet cat. You, you people ever hear of a civet cat? I think some of you have. Yeah. Maybe some of you men, Pat knows something about it. I don't have to find out what. But anyway, they're uh, protected either. It's, it's like a skunk. Most people call them skunk. But it has spots on it instead of stripes. And, uh, this, this is an Indiana skunk. We don't have this pretty striped skunk here in Alabama. He's wider striped and flat and broad, and he's fatter, bigger. But this, we got for show and tail, you know. So he's a good, he's a good one. Uh, and we have, we have a lot of, we have a lot of skunks. Uh, this is, this is an Alabama skunk called, he's called a ball face skunk. You see here? Now, I have a friend that uh, is a duck hunter in Scottsboro area. So at the end of duck season, we went up there one afternoon and uh, to store the boat. And it was uh, in the first two weeks in January. It was a warm, rainy weekend, and the uh, skunks had been getting to mate. So they had, had a heyday of being out the night before. So between Scottsboro and Bridgeport, I tell my friend I, we, on the side of the four lane, I said, pull up here by this skunk. So I rolled down the window. If I could smell him, I said, drive on. <laughs> so out of 12 skunks, we found two that no, wasn't older, you know, killed outright. So I let someone else talk me out of the other one. But they are, uh, they're, they're beautiful. But they're all, uh, they, they all have that odor to them. And uh, in dealing with them, always, they're beneficial to you around your house if, if you don't have something to disturb them every once in a while. But if he disturbs you, you, you've got problems. Now, they've come out now with this. Trap is one of the, the very best things ever for stunt. Now this trap costs 50 bucks and uh, it's got a door trip on it like the old rabbit box thing. But anyway, the, uh, you can set it and, and bait it with cat food and catch it. But when I said it was beneficial, he's a grub eater. And uh, my uh, brother up in Georgia had uh, six big apple trees in a row uh, there and they 
had tremendous uh, crops of apples on them every year. Then comes the Japanese beetle. Some of y'all have heard of Japanese beetle? Well, they just riddled his trees. And uh, they, uh, but he, he didn't bother. Then comes, what, Hurricane Ivan or something? What was that several years ago? But blew down the wind, had terrific wind. But he had a lot of nice pines that blew down there. A lot of the pines. This made a, a clay root the place. Well, the skunks moved in on those clay roots. And he had a lot of skunks around the house. He also had a barn and hay in it. But he didn't. He had a couple of dogs, big dogs. They learned to leave them alone, so he didn't have any problem with them much. But come after the Japanese beetles left, those skunks come out there and they got the grub. It, you couldn't put your finger down where they hadn't turned out and got the grub. So that was an advantage for that. But he had a, he had quite a spell with one. Uh, he, uh, his house was about three foot off the ground. And he had a, a door in it, like getting under all that. But so he noticed one day that uh, the, the skunk was coming between the barn and the house. So he ran around the house and followed him and disappeared. So that was a problem. He knew he knew what the deal was. So he got his flashlight and went on up underneath the house. And he had, a, of course, back in the country, you had a well and well pump, and the water had to be piped in, and it had to be. Uh, freeze proof and all and so he had built him up that and then was just, so what did Mr. Skunk do but he goes and heads off in there so <laughs> my uh, my brother he said well nothing but one thing to do go back out and tear into that so he tore into it and when it, when he was tearing into it he, he disturbed Mr. Skunk and, uh, <laughs> mama was unhappy with that and, but anyway that was a skunk story from his house and all so, it, uh, uh, here's a couple of fox squirrels. These are actually not fur bearing animals, but it's hard. I, I pick up a lot of roadkill animals. These two were, uh, one of them is from Cherokee County. This is Cherokee County, and uh, this one is on just off of Elk River. And we were coming out from trout fishing one day, and it just got hit in front of us, so we brought those in and tanned those. Here's Mr. Bobcat. He's a, a lot of you have never seen a live one in the woods, no. And but he's a, he's a real good hunter, a real crafty, real crafty. After after we get through, y'all can come and see these and hand on whatever. This is a roadkill. He got run over the back hips, you know. He busted across the back hips and busted better. So I took a stop and took a look at him. I said, well, I'll just get that out and then next up. The bobcat fur and the lynx and all in the lynx and the western bobcat, the western bobcats are running the prime good ones and some that you saw in that book there, running five and six hundred dollars per pair. Now that, that's big money. And that's, but you don't catch many of them. Those guys that make a, make a, uh, make a habit of it, they don't catch many. They, they spend the whole year getting prepared and all. This is a, one that was also a roadkill. And my little trout fishing buddy picked this one up and he wasn't hurt near as bad. And, uh, and the, 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 fellas, the tanner should have, I send these off and I, some I tan. I did tan that other, but I didn't feel like send this one off. But anyway, he should have sewn up that little place on. But they're, they're very nice and the, and the bellies are the, the, where the, the real good fur is. Okay, we got him right here. Beaver. New trip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, this was imported into into Louisiana. They thought it'd be a great improvement for the fur industry there. Louisiana <coughs> caught hundreds of thousands of muskrats, all that marsh and area. They used to go in there and they caught most muskrats in it. Place of work. Now this is a this is an Australian here. It's this when the when the animal control person catches this pail and and when he's beaver trapping and all, he'll he most of those have them a working man or two to take care of their furs and all. This one this one will only sell for two or three dollars, so that's ridiculous, you know. His fur is is fair. It's between 
the muskrat and the beaver, but he's not popular and he's all, he's up as far as Tuscaloosa now. We've not not had in this area, and I hope we don't get it. What'd you say it was called? Pardon? What? Nutria, N-U-T-R-I-A, Nutria. Oh, okay. Dog okay. size rat. Yeah, or big rat. Big rat. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They'll get to be 100 pounds, I think. Well, they, they get to be big. Okay. This is the red fox. This, you know what he is. Okay. My daughter uh, worked at Goodyear until recently, and so on her way from Rabbit Down Road to Goodyear, she went on the back way, 278, and cut in back to the hospital. And she had been seeing this little fox cross the road early in the morning for nearly a year. So one morning she called me and said, Dad, what are you doing? I said, I'm having breakfast, not eating out of my pajamas. She said, well, I saw the little red fox. It got hit and knocked up on the side of the road by the cemetery. I said, I said well, uh, I'll run over and get it. She said, no, I'll just run back and get it and uh, bring it to you. So I'm going to get it. So anyway, this... She didn't know this at the time, but when she brought it, she got a garbage bag and brought it to it. It wasn't damaged too bad. But, but she was sucking pups at that time, so she had four pups. Uh -huh. Now, the male fox will help feed the, the litter, the gray and the red. But this one was too, uh, this one was suckling, so it could not use rats or squirrels or anything. So I'm pretty sure we lost that litter of foxes. But I knew where this den was for 25, 30 years. I knew about this, and we discussed that. Much. But I carried these, and I have carried them many places to the different places. So a little boy, he's pulling on the tail, so he pulled the tail. <laughs> I did not say anything to him. But I, didn't the teeth. <laughs> I don't. I really. I've never. I've always been so glad to uh, to share it with them and all. So anyway, this this is the gray fox. And it's a beautiful piece of fur. And uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s, these this is a small one. They get about some of them get twice as big, but they were running forty dollars per pelt at that time. And the reds, the big reds and all, were running up to sixty dollars. And there was there was few bucks to be made with them then. But everybody everybody then wanted to be a trapper, so. <coughs> We had a lot of trouble then, but nobody knew what they were doing. They were catching all the people's dog and making all the people unhappy, and then they started hating us, the, the people that knew what they were doing and were doing something. Uh, I will show you this. This is this this pelt prime would be this red and this dark all the way down here. You can see right here where it's beginning to lose its prime and losing its fur, and he'll get this ragged looking as he can be feeding those pets. And, uh, babies and all during the summer and all. Uh, now back back to the beaver. Uh, <coughs> the beaver is a real nuisance. And they were reported over over around twenty three or twenty four hundred caught last year. That's all reporting. I imagine there's that many more just shot and thrown away. Uh, this is a prime pelt. You see this pelt here? It's beginning to lose its prime. You see this right here? It's beginning to lose its prime. Some people think, well, if a mink is the mink, one well, of it ought to be worth forty dollars and that other mink ought to be worth that's not true. It's the pelt and the, and in the mink deal, the males uh, bring twice as much money as the female. And uh, this this beaver, we had no beavers here. And so, in, uh, I don't remember exactly when, but they imported some beavers from Iowa. And this is a pale beaver. You notice that it's pale compared to the other dark beavers? This is a prime beaver, see? And, and you notice how many, how much felt, uh, millions of fiber here in this, you know, very, very, uh, very good and durable. And this, we this is what <clears throat> brought uh, brought our uh, uh, was helped settle the west and the northwest and all. So it's the time to change your hat. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the Hudson Bay Company established trapping outposts 
in Canada and across North America early on in the early 1800s, late 1700s. The beaver was the prime fur tail of, of the fur trade going to England. Do you know what they used it for, basically? Hats, Hats. wasn't it? Hats. They didn't use them per se as a tail. They cut the, they sheared the fur off of them and made fur felt and made bigger hats out of the fur felt. So that went on for years and then they discovered silk. This is a mink choker that I had made for my wife in about late 1970s. And this has been kept in the cedar chest every year in a little plastic bag. And my wife, um, she, she was beautiful in it. She was beautiful anyway to me. But anyway, she wore this with a suit and a, and a dressy dress, which really dressed it up. You don't see many, many, many people. A lot of people got them in their, in their cedar chest and all. But uh, this is three large male men. These are the large males. I caught all three of these. Two of them came from Edward County and one from Calhoun County, just over the way there. And so we're going to get on to, to this. Uh, I want to show you Alabama's most prized fur-bearing animal, the river otter. You want to help me go up? Oh, help me stretch out these here words. These are big male otters, and uh, they are, I'm oh, sorry, just, just hold that up for me. Now I've got one for this, this other one here. So those, uh, I think I sent those, uh, I think I sent those off to have them pan, and it cost $27 a piece to have them pan to grow in that. Of course, I had my, uh, I had my jacket made, and I would like for you ladies to try that on. And if you got a camera, just let somebody snap your picture of it, all like that. But this is a nice, fine, heavy otter that I tan myself here. It's just, a, but it's, and this 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 will last a hundred years if you take care of it. And they are beautiful animal, very beautiful, very playful, and very destructive to the catfish farm. And it does, not only that, but the brim ponds and all. So okay, you can hang them up for you. Yeah, but, uh, a little. Uh, Greg's, uh, Greg's, uh, Greg works for Freeman Land and they have a secretary that lives at Steel, isn't it? Okay. So they, they, they had a wet weather spring in their backyard. So they had a, a, a backhoe dig it out and made them a nice little pond back there. Built them a little wood bridge across that. Got them some koi, pretty the goldfish, piggins, and that. Put up some fine bluegill in there and fed them babies every day. And that was fine. <laughs> One night she went, to, um, she was just a little further than that back wall from that pond. And so she uh, she went out. She hears a noise. She hears something going on out there. So she went out. She looked down that way. She hears splashing and all that going on, but she didn't know what was going on. So she had a neighbor that was a. Uh, was a coon hunter. So she calls him and says, hey, come over here. Something's going tearing up the back pool. So he came over and he brought his, he brought his big flashlight and his shotgun. So what do we have? We have five otters on that little bitty pond. And one of them has one of the big koi up on the little bridge. He's up there and he chowed down on that. So he bangs away and kills a couple of them and wounds another. But they, that came off of a little branch. That, that little... Uh, that little spring branch fed into a larger branch down there. And they came up, they smelled that koi and those fish coming from that. So they followed that up and they found them a real picnic. So he comes in and calls me and said, uh, Mr. Green, there's two laying in the backyard if you want to go look at them. So I said, well, I'll drive down and look at them. And they were okay, so I did get them in tan. But they, they were not prime, but they were, they were, I don't have them here, but I still have one of them. But anyway, they were brown and I did salvage them. And she's never put any fish back in there. And I asked her if I'm sick. You put some fish in? No, I'm not doing it for those freeloaders. I'm not doing it. <laughs> anyway, another thing, a strange thing that happened. She comes in early one morning and they, their office is right at the foot of Broad Street below Riverview there, Freeman Land. So we had a flood of rain. So she gets there early and she parks there and she looks out there. She saw an animal laying there on the road, 
and she shies away and went on in the office and Greg showed up right a few minutes later. She said, uh, there's some kind of dead animal out there. And Greg said, yeah. He said, I'll call the city and let them pick it up. He said, don't bother. He said, I already put it in the truck. So Mr. Green's going to get that. <laughs> it was a nice big order. And, and it, it, the flood of rain in the night, it probably, all that flood of water coming in, it came into that little pool there below the hospital. And then it come on up and the car got it. So we, it was a good pail. So we had air muffs made out of it. <laughs> These are real nice. This one has its fur lined completely. And this one costs 19 bucks to get it made. That's Martha's. That goes with her. And this is this is mine. Of course, I had two or three others made that I gave away. But these are very nice, and they they're very they're very warm and very warm. So we uh, how we doing for time? Uh, you know, we're doing fine, but uh, you might want to open up for some questions, Jim. I'm sit down. Okay. But, uh, Why don't you open up for some questions? I'm sure okay. you know it's been very Sit interesting. Down. Get you a chair. We'll pull you a chair up. Uh, let me do, let me just go on this and then we'll take the chair. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're getting down to Mr. Uh, Mr. Problem Character. We're getting into the college now. We need one of our very bad predators. Uh, I don't know if you people notice in the Jetson Times, you look and see a uh, lost cat, lost cat, lost cat, lost cat, lost cat. And I always look to see where it's at. The majority of them up and not really falling up on top of the mountain. There. So a cat doesn't have a chance with a foot race with a coyote. And so most of them are fat and lazy and they get out. And so, and there's so much uh, hope timber and all around around that area there that they'll hang out in the edge and they've, they've got where they're not afraid of man the man's sin but they'll they'll pick up the cat and also they get the little dog they know that they, a, a dog or a cat no no match for them and their strong jaws I, I don't have a skull here but you wouldn't believe i have the front teeth of a lot of them that i pulled and made my necklace and i have enough for another necklace but this is just their front teeth right here. Will they hurt a person? No, no. That, if you if you have one hemmed up and uh, to, he, he's going to defend himself, but for his attacking. You know. Jim, are they basically canines? I mean, could they breed with a dog? They could, yes, couldn't they? Right, right, right. Yes, indeed, that's true. And uh, they are. Uh, the only way, they will not go in a cage trap. I brought the big cage trap. Now, the coons will go in that, the possums, and uh, and I believe, I mentioned it, Steve, I believe, a, I believe that an armadillo will go in there. I believe if you will set it and put a plank or something, you can guide him probably and get him to go in there. But you can't hardly hold an armadillo on a steel trap with a hard legs and all, you know. So anyway, you're going to have more trouble with them in the coming the coyote, you've got to trap him or call him up and shoot him. That's the two options you've got for a coyote. So that's what you're looking at. Uh, right, right, uh, right here. And on Mike, Mike McCormick and, and Martha land borders the trade school junior college property from Riverside Drive to the river. And then from there, all the way up here, back of the dormitory, on the river and all, there's a kudzu patch that a, you can't stick a toothpick on it. So there's a wonderful place for the pack to live in. And that's where that pack has been living for several years. I have caught several of them. And and my, my nephew was visiting. He was on his way to Dakota, Decatur last year. And he came out and visited me. And he went back and went back out. Anyway, he knew the way back in, so he went over came in from that way from 278 and came and come from and he got down to between Goodyear and Walmart entrance and then he called me on his cell phone. He said, Jim, or no Uncle Neil. <laughs> he said there's a good looking coyote bumped up on the on the off the road up there between Goodyear and the Walmart entrance. So I go over and look at it. So I went over. So this I feel like that, that coyote came right up this draw, right on the went, got up there. 
got confused, got on the road, and got waylaid by a truck. I tanned this belt myself, and so I didn't see him off. Now, we got it. We got some of his, uh, this one, Mike shot, Mike McCormick shot this one in his passion. So there, this probably could well be that this is a, the son of this one right here. It's, it's young, and he was beginning to prime up. He's not, this has got good fur on him for his fur. Okay, this is a roadkill. So I looked and stopped and looked at him, and his fur was so good, he busted wide open. I said, well, I'll just take him and, and pull him out flat and paint him, which I did. And so that one. This one, uh, a deer hunting friend of mine and a trap, fellow trapper, a young man down uh, just, uh, at Equality, Alabama, just north of Wetumpka. Was in it. I met him down there at the trapping club and uh, also at Fort Toulouse. He always uh, met me there. So he shot this. So I traded him for, I traded him a, a, a tandem of coon and something else for this and traded him out of this because he said, there's a family of these and I'll get me another one. So, so thus far he hadn't got it. But anyway, he's working on it. Uh, this one is a black one. I think that, this, is, this is a mighty nice pelt here. My, this came from the Georgia and Alabama lines uh, about 10 miles from Cave Springs, Georgia. And my nephew, my wife's nephew, my nice nephew too, but he walks two miles every morning walking. So he's been seeing this black cow across the road for nearly eight or nine months. One morning he called me and says, Uncle Jim, said that somebody would run over the black cow. I said, well, they tear him up. He said, not too bad. He said, knocked his left leg off. <laughs> So I said, well, I said, did you bring it in? He said, I got it on the tailgate truck. I said, take the hose and wash it off and get the blood off and I'll be up there in two hours. So this, was a good, this was a good display pad, you know. So that's a... Mr. Green. Jim, when you find one like that that's on the side of the road, uh, you clean him right there? No. And, uh, hey, it's a problem. You just you put them in a garbage bag. I carry garbage bags all the time. If it's not bad, a lot of them are damaged bad. You don't. You take them, look at them, and in, in a minute until you know whether you're going to do anything with them. So, Mr. Grant, is a winter fur better than a summer fur? No. 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 Uh -uh. No. Uh -uh. The winter fur is a prime fur. That's when they prime up. Just by nature, they're going to prime up in in the winter winter time and all like that. Uh, uh, This is a this is a fur that has lost its prime. You see here, you see here. Mm -hmm. To you, that's a beaver pelt. If they're selling for twenty dollars, you think this one ought to sell for twenty. He's worth two dollars. <laughs> then you've got to do all that kind of work or anything like that. This is the new fangal way of, of of a hook. Now I use plywood, and that's easier than you lace them in a hook for looks and all. But these two are not. These are not. These are not really prime beaver, but they 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 stand the stand the test. So I'm uh, uh, okay. I got one more thing, and then I'm going to flake out. How many trappers I got in the audience? <laughs> How many trappers? I know this one is tried and true, and we've got a new young man back there, Mr. Rose, that is venturing off. You can't get any of the kids harder to go at. We are trying to establish uh, clubs of kids, and we have five places we've established them in the state of Alabama, and I've been able to attend those and all, and, uh, all, and help them out with some of that. I didn't. Ha I had a couple of trappers that I know were trappers. Okay, you you people say you're not trappers. You're not animal to control persons. <laughs> How about it, folks? <laughs> Men, do you make your wife do the mouth strapping? Yeah. They do the cleaning. Okay. This, this is a gopher rat trap. And you have him around your barns and everything else. And it, it, it'll, it'll, it'll nearly break your finger, so it will kill a, it will kill a gopher rat. The, I'll give you a hint here. You take the milk carton, and cut this milk carton like this, set this trap, 
put your bait on it and set it set it back here and keep always keep your hands and fingers on the bottom side and below and back of it. You 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 slip it right in here and you bait it and this gives you a guide. You guide them in there, see? You guide them in there and he they dispatch it. Mm. Always when you're whatever trap and all mouse trap or whatnot, tie it down. I've caught my meese by the tail, they'll drag the trap off, <laughs> and you won't find him until <laughs> until he's easy found. <laughs> and I reckon I, I believe most everybody has a few mice around around the house, time some time or other, and they're hard to. Uh, all right, the little mouse, the little mouse trap, and there is a used to be a rat trap. I don't know if they got it in between this side. But you take a talcum powder can, cut it out like this. Put your bait on it, and I use cheese or peanut butter. Both of them are very good. Put it in here, tie it to here, and set it underneath that. This guy's just right into it and nails it. But if you just set it in under the cabinet or somewhere, catch it by the tail of the leg, and away he goes, and you've got problem beyond that. Okay, I got a, I got a, a young couple that, that built a new house. They, they were good and, and wonderful to get an opportunity to build them a new house. So they built it on a slab. You know what a concrete slab? The door put, that, put all the stuff in that. No, they built it on the slab. They built the garage right by the kitchen door and the utility room and all that. It's ground level. So, so they've had supper. <clears throat> they had a nice supper. Hubby retreated to the den. He was watching TV or something. Wasn't helping with the dishes. But she's fortunate she was, uh, she had a dishwasher, so she was getting cleaned up and put in the dishwasher. And so, as the last person in came in, they didn't quite push the garage door to me, out of the garage into the kitchen. So she's over here, she's putting the dishes away. She's got the door down on here, she's putting the dishes in. But out of the corner of her eye, she sees something. So she looks at her. And then she screams like the panther got hurt. <laughs> and then she screams again, and then that scares him out of his wits. So he comes charging into the kitchen. So when he gets into the kitchen, he looks and she's backed up sitting on the counter up here. What happened when that door was open, that little old bitty mouse, he found this, he's going around the wall, he found that opening. He goes back and goes in there. Well, she caught a glimpse of him. And so he, she had the door down, so the uh, shatter, you know, the mouse, he shows the dark place. So he heads over there, and she's there, and that scared her even more, and that's when she just automatically bound up on him. So she's screaming, so he comes in, and he says, what in the world is the matter with you? Look, 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 do something, do something, do something. He looked at the situation. In the meantime, she did one of those ladies saying, I can't do this with a with a hip broken. But you know, you've seen somebody even pitch a hissy fit or a jump up and down and stomp. Well, when the, the mouse was going toward the shattered place, so she stepped on it. But then she bound it up. <laughs> she said, do something, do something. He looked at her. He said, well, I'll go get the mop. He said, I never dreamed there could be that much water in one little old mouse. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about that. <laughs>